Well, hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Michael Kugelman. I'm the Asia Program Deputy Director and Senior Associate for South Asia here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. We are very pleased to be hosting, in partnership with Voice of America, today's event on Afghanistan. Over the next hour, we will be hosting a special screening of the new VOA short documentary, Homeland. After that, I will co-moderate, along with Breshna or Marhil of VOA, an expert panel discussion about the documentary, and more broadly about Afghanistan in the year since the Taliban takeover and U.S. withdrawal. That discussion will include a Q&A with our small in-person audience here at the Wilson Center and with our online audience. For those watching online who would like to ask a question, please email it to asia at wilsoncenter.org or tweet it to at Asia program. First, however, we will have some brief opening comments from Mark Green, CEO and president of the Wilson Center. He could not be with us today, but he has kindly recorded a brief video comment, which we will play right now. Hello, and welcome to today's important discussion. My name is Ambassador Mark Green, and I'm the president of the Wilson Center here in Washington, D.C. Congress established the Wilson Center some five decades ago for the purpose, in their words, of strengthening the fruitful relation between the world of learning and the world of public affairs. That special charter means that our currency is knowledge, our focus is independent analysis, and our purpose is offering ideas and analysis that decision makers can believe in. It also means that we're fiercely nonpartisan. Today marks exactly one year since the last U.S. troops left Afghanistan, and just over a year since the Taliban seized power. I know that for so many in Afghanistan and for so many of those who fled that country, leaving family and friends behind, marking this anniversary can be a traumatic experience. But mark it we must, for there are lessons to be learned. In the midst of the withdrawal last summer, the Wilson Center launched a new series called Hindsight Up Front. Its purpose is to analyze events as they're occurring. Think tanks and policy centers generally produce reports and analysis after the fact. We want to pull together ideas and analysis as close to real time as possible, and then use it to imagine what the future might hold. We've produced panels, interviews, articles, and more that capture the views of former U.S. policymakers and military officials, regional analysts, and most importantly, Afghans themselves, especially Afghan women. There have been no shortage of things to discuss, from Afghanistan's terrible humanitarian crisis to what the withdrawal means for the status of women and the role of civil society. We've also looked at the impacts of the withdrawal on regional and global geopolitics. Of course, just because the U.S. and coalition forces have withdrawn, that doesn't mean that Afghanistan's significance has faded away. At the center, we will continue to focus on Afghanistan for some time to come. There will be many critical policy questions to grapple with. How to ease a humanitarian and economic crisis that has gone from worse to even worse. How to help Afghan women, journalists, activists, and others struggling under Taliban rule. What to expect from a Taliban regime that has struggled badly with issues of governance. And what does all of this mean for the world's struggle against terrorism? The recent drone strike on Al-Qaeda leader Ayman al-Zawahiri in downtown Kabul, the first known U.S. airstrike in Afghanistan in 11 months, it raises crucial questions for the months and years ahead. Will there be more drone strikes? Will the Taliban feel pressure to do more to curb terrorist threats, to live up to their obligations under the Doha Agreement, or will they double down and show defiance? These are just some of the questions to consider. Today, Wilson is pleased to be hosting an event in partnership with the Voice of America on the impact of the U.S. withdrawal one year later. We'll be featuring a short video clip produced by VOA, followed by a panel discussion moderated by my colleague Michael Kugelman, who directs our work in Afghanistan. We're very pleased to be working with VOA, and we're grateful that they have allowed us the opportunity to share some of their new content. Our goal is to convey the personal stories of Afghans over the last year, and those stories are so much more impactful when we can see them and hear their voices. I'm confident that the video we see shortly will set the stage for a very meaningful discussion. I also want to acknowledge that some VOA employees were directly and personally impacted by the events in August 2021. 
They have been courageous in bringing the stories of Afghanistan to audiences all around the world, and they've done so at great personal cost. We're truly fortunate to be able to draw on their work and to work with them, not just then in Afghanistan, but in the months and years ahead. I will now turn things over to Michael Kugelman, who will be today's event moderator. Well, thank you very much to um, Ambassador Mark Green for those comments. Uh, we are now indeed going to watch the VOA short documentary, uh, Homeland, which will run for about 10 minutes. It focuses on Zara Nabi, a female journalist who refused to flee Taliban rule. It is produced and edited by Deepak Dobal, and Aisha Tanzim is the executive producer. We hope you enjoy it. This is my homeland, my grandfather, my grandmother, and I was born here. This land is really a good land for us. In tough times, I shouldn't leave my land. I think it is a responsibility of for us. Otherwise, homeland has no meaning. My name is Zahra Nabi. I'm a journalist living in Afghanistan, mainly in Kabul city. Every day they are becoming powerful, they are becoming rich, and they have everything in their hand. The people here keep silent because they cannot say anything, do anything against the rule of the Taliban. I cannot see any powerful one that can stand in front of them. I have less and less and less hope of Taliban to be changed. So I feel very bad, but I keep myself busy. I said if you keep yourself busy, it won't depress you. So I am continuing collecting reports. Even I don't have anywhere to broadcast these reports. For me, it is archiving, and I hope that one day I could share with the people, with the world, that these people left behind alone, and no one was taking care of them. It is not that the Taliban let me work. They didn't give me a permission. I am collecting reports and other things. It's not really easy. But I am doing these things, sometimes hiding. In some press conferences, they just allow me. In some, they don't allow. They think she cannot do anything against us, and she's not as powerful as she can hurt us. Ten months before once the Taliban came in power, I was really hopeful that this will be changed after six months. Because people were in, uh, inside Afghanistan and they started protesting. They started complaining and they didn't want to accept. But you know, the people left, the activists, the journalists, the one they knew, the one they educated, the one they were powerful, they left. And now I'm seeing around myself poor people, old people, children, mostly illiterate women, people just looking to feed themselves. And then on the other hand, I see the very powerful group. On the first press conference of Taliban, I was the only Afghan female journalist over there. I asked Abilai Mujahid about the situation of women. 
women if they are allowed to work, um, especially women in media and women allowed to study. And his answer was, you should wait. Later on, we will announce. When Zabila Mujahid said that you should wait, then I had doubt. They are like the past, but this time they changed and they became clever. They know now how to do it in front of the media, in front of the international community. But once they know that there is no one around to see them and watch them, they are doing very, very tough things. Doing protests and demonstrating, we cannot reach our goals. It is not uh, easy and it's not working. I will continue fighting, but fighting, it doesn't mean that I will go and just fight in front of them, but yeah, I will continue. Just trying a little bit, a little bit, to aware the people that for their rights. If the community will be changed, if the people will be changed, everything will be changed. It is tough, but uh, I know if we, if we want to do something, we can do it. I really afraid sometimes I felt that uh, something will happen to me, maybe I, they will put me on, on, on prison or jail or something like this. Hopefully, they won't send me by force. I really don't want to leave the country because I grew up as a refugee in other countries. We were in Kabul, Afghanistan, but we left because of civil war. I was really a child that cannot notice anything more than seeing around that it is all war, everywhere was destroyed. When the Taliban took the control of the city, the previous time I was in Pakistan and I was going to primary school. In 2011, once my university finished, so I decided to come back in Afghanistan, in Kabul. My sister in Canada and brothers are in the United States. When they heard, they were shocked. And really, they didn't expect me that I could choose back Afghanistan rather to be in other countries. I said, it's my homeland. I want to try, and I want to go there and do my best. And they said that you're wasting your time. But that time, I didn't care, and I came alone. I became a teacher in a remote area in the north. And slowly, slowly, I could join the media of Afghanistan. In 2017, finally, we could approach our dream, and then we opened Bano TV. It was for women by women. The camera woman, the director, all of them were women. I thought that it's not real. I'm dreaming. You know, sometimes you're thinking that you're not in the earth, you're not in your place, and it means that you're dreaming. For me, it was like this. 15 August 2021 is again the, the date that I cannot forget. Taliban came in power. We shut down the TV station. Most of our colleagues, they left the country. Me with one of the, my colleagues were alone and we pack all of the equipment and store it. It was really hard. Day by day, I felt very, very tired. Most things depressed me that 
Everyone, the young people, all of them say, I don't want to stay in this country, I just want to leave. Then asking me that you are also wasting your time, you should leave the country. And this also really makes me very sad, very depressed. But I'm very happy that I didn't leave the country, even I had opportunity. I still have the opportunity to leave the country. Even in tough times, I can't stand. And these things, it makes me day by day strong. And I can see around me a lot of other girls and women. They stand and they are trying to live. So I'd like to congratulate our VOA colleagues uh, once again for that very stirring documentary. Uh, we've heard so much, for good reason, um, about the many Afghans who have fled the country, but less about those, uh, and especially the women who have bravely chosen to stay. So I'd now like to invite uh, our speakers, as well as our co-moderator, Reshna, to come up to the, to the main table, and we'll begin our discussion. So we're going to talk more about the documentary, but um, first I wanted to introduce our, our expert panel here uh, with us this morning. We are very grateful to have with us, first of all, uh, Mirwais Balki. This event essentially, I believe, marks the very first public appearance of Mirwais as a Wilson Center Fellow. Uh, we are delighted to have him with us. He was Afghanistan's Minister of Education from 2018 to 2020. He also held several positions within Afghanistan's Foreign Service. He's also a scholar um, of West Asia. He has a PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, and he recently served as a visiting scholar at Georgetown School of Foreign Service. We also have with us, appearing virtually, uh, Rangina Hamidi. She is professor of practice at Thunderbird School of Global Management at Arizona State University. For two decades, beginning in 2003, she worked as an activist and development practitioner focused on education and women's economic empowerment. And more recently, until August 2021, she was Afghanistan's education minister. Finally, uh, we are joined by Ambassador Earl uh, Anthony Wayne, or Tony, as we call him. He is another colleague of mine uh, at the Wilson Center. He's a public policy fellow here. He has the rank of career ambassador in the U.S. Foreign Service. His senior postings included or have included coordinating director for development and economic affairs and deputy U.S. ambassador in Kabul from 2009 to 2011. He's been a very active voice on Afghanistan issues during his time at the Wilson Center, and we're very, we're very grateful for that. Finally, we have Breshna Omarhel of VOA, who will co-moderate the discussion with me. I want to clarify that this is a discussion that will be co-moderated by both Breshna and myself. Breshna is an award-winning Afghan-American journalist who's been with VOA's Afghanistan service in D.C. since 2006. She's an anchor, producer, and reporter. And anyone who's checked out VOA's coverage of Afghanistan from, from Washington over, the, over recent years will be very familiar with her excellent work. So I'd like, it, in just a moment, I'd like to start this discussion by getting some brief reactions from each of our three panelists to the documentary that we just saw. But first, I know that Breshna... Uh, just recently spoke with the subject of this <coughs> film, uh, Zara, and uh, Breshna has a few updates on her situation since the filming of the documentary. So Breshna, why don't you first fill us in on that? Thank you, Michael, for the kind introduction. Um, uh, I'm grateful to be here. Hi, everybody. Uh, this was indeed really a powerful story. As an Afghan woman, who spent most of my life under the Soviet occupation, the civil war, and then under the Taliban in 1990s. I can relate to this story in many ways, uh, but the thing that makes Zara different is that she is stronger, has faced the tough conditions, and has stayed back. Uh, she has the courage, resilience, and determination to fight for the rights of millions of 
uh, voiceless Afghan women uh, by choosing to live among them. I spoke with Zara on Sunday to get an update on how life was uh, for her. She said the space for her work has gradually been narrowed and she has been told she cannot come to press conferences anymore. She went to a joint Ministry of uh, Interior and Ministry of Defense press conference on Sunday, but was not allowed to ask any questions. According to her, unfortunately, foreign organizations working inside Afghanistan are also now accepting the Taliban rule of replacing women employees with men. She said she herself was working as a freelancer with a European NGO, which continues to operate inside Afghanistan. She was recently told by this NGO that she will not work with them anymore. They want a man to replace her. Hmm. Uh, thanks, Prashna. Um, so we'll come back to, to Zara later, because I know <laughs> that she wanted to convey some additional thoughts to all of us, uh, and we'll let her do that through through Prashna in just a bit. But let's now get some, some very brief reactions to this documentary from our panelists. And maybe, Rangina, we could start with you. Uh, you've been an Afghan women's activist for many years. What do you think about Zara's story? Hey, everybody. It's good to be here with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, to be quite honest, I. I'm trying to contain my emotions personally um, as a woman um, because I can totally relate to and hear Zara's story, even though I chose to leave last year uh, with my daughter. Um, my, my only reaction is that the hardest thing in life is to be away from a place you call home. Thank you for that. Um, maybe we could turn to you now, Mirwise. Uh, you know, you w what do you, an, an Afghan scholar and, and a former policymaker as well, think that it might say about the future of Afghanistan that there are people like like Zara who have decided to stay and are trying to make contributions to society? So I'd welcome your reaction to the film as well. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I think the story of Zahra is the story of every Afghan, not only women but also men there in Afghanistan because initially everyone of us were thinking that there would be changes with the Taliban as the media was also portraying. I remained in Afghanistan for two weeks under Taliban and I was thinking that there would be spaces for me to stay in, in country and continue my activities in different platforms or different ways but then I was witnessing extrajudicial activities and some of the pressures on men and women in Afghanistan. And that's why I thought there is a gradual hopelessness and depression and there would be no space for us, no leveraging factors on Taliban so that at least they can give us some spaces to work in Afghanistan. That is why in the story of Zahra also, you could see very frankly that she's talking about the gradual hopelessness in Afghanistan and the dark side of uh, not any opportunity available for anyone in the country, especially for women uh, who are uh, uh, more into pressures. So uh, uh, that is why uh, if I conclude this story, uh, I say that uh, this depression and hopelessness will uh, give the way to those people who are strong enough to work in Afghanistan. Even they will fade up and they will give up uh, to do something for the country. Hmm. Thanks, uh, Mirwais. Um, Tony, Ambassador Wayne, at, at one point in the film, uh, Zara, as I recall, draws a, a contrast between 2017 when she and several other women uh, launched a new TV channel in 2021 after the takeover when they shut down the channel. Uh, we never hear her say in the film anything about the U.S. withdrawal or U.S. policy in Afghanistan, but do you think that her story, uh, one where her career, uh, like that of so many other Afghan women, uh, suffered such a major blow last, uh, last August, do you think that her story reflects a failure of U.S. objectives and interests in Afghanistan? Yes, <laughs> I do. I think if, if we look back the last several years, particularly in U.S. policy, we, we had a massively 
unsuccessful exit strategy. We crafted a, a very bad agreement with the Taliban. We then uh, poorly implemented that agreement and the withdrawal that clearly the president and others wanted to bring about for, U for U.S. troops. And then we made a number of serious mistakes uh, last year in finalizing that withdrawal and leaving. That doesn't mean there weren't people working hard to maintain the programs that we had invested in to help Afghans over those 20 years. There were a number of very, very good programs that helped make things possible, like this network of well-educated Afghan women uh, broadcasting the news. Uh, Afghanistan was one of the, the real leaders in the region for free media. Uh, we had whole generations of tremendously well-educated young Afghans ready to take the reins of power and move forward. And we had other segments of the population with new skills that they did not have before. There were all these opportunities. But that was put all in danger by the manner in which we decided to leave the country. A and I think we have to remember that in addition to this very moving documentary, millions and millions of Afghans are in danger of dying from lack of food and medical care and others. And men probably many did die, I don't know the numbers, but many were, were certainly barely got by with the relief of the international uh, community, including the United States, which was vital, but we're still facing that situation today. Mm -hmm. So we have at all different levels of society in Afghanistan and all different dimensions of where the United States tried to help, even though we made many mistakes along the way. We did, we tried seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just left with a, a terribly complicated situation and not much leverage right now to really be of assistance except to keep that basic relief flows going and look for opportunities. But, but it's really important to remember the Taliban really aren't interested. They're trying to consolidate what they see as a historic victory and consolidate their Islamic regime, and that's where their focus is. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tony. And in fact, you, you anticipated my next question, uh, and I want to uh, throw things back to Breshna in a moment because I know that she has some questions. But one final question I'll ask to the three the three panelists um, is that you know as you noted, uh, Tony, there there's so many stories from from Afghanistan uh, over the last year. We've heard the story of of Zara and the travails of of women, but of course the issue of acute economic hardship is such a, a big a big thing. People are also struggling with terrorism risks. We know that's a big reality as well. Um, but there are also stories involving people that are welcoming the end of 40 years of war for, 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 uh, uh, for Afghans. So I'd like to ask each of you uh, if you could briefly um, identify what you think has been the biggest storyline to emerge from Afghanistan over the last year, whether positive, negative, or both. What do you think is the one big takeaway from the last year? And I know that it's hard to identify just one, but if you each wanted to pick one, what would that be? Um, Maybe, uh, Mirwais, do you want to start? Uh, uh, well, uh, when we look at Afghanistan in the past one year, we have uh, different stories, different layers of stories on all dimensions, from economy to uh, even natural catastrophes that we are uh, witnessing nowadays. But for me, uh, the mother catastrophe is the gradual collapse of infrastructure in Afghanistan. Uh, because at least uh, we had a trembling infrastructure in Afghanistan to serve the people. And when I, as the Minister of Education, was comparing uh, before Taliban and after Taliban, I was thinking that uh, despite all the difficulties, uh, we had at least progression because we were transforming from uh, quantity-oriented policies to quality-oriented policies. We are thinking about quality education in Afghanistan. But now, when I'm looking for the same ministry and when I'm uh, receiving the reports from all different departments of the Ministry of Education, there is a gradual collapse. The people, they are leaving. The institutional memory is no, no more there. And uh, the, the same curriculum, the same department, the same people uh, that we built up gradually on different 
capable people to train the education to serve the children in Afghanistan. So the, si the similar situation we have in all other ministries, all other departments, because even the same lang language, the same communication uh, line, the same uh, hierarchy, uh, the, the, the bureaucracy, we do not have anymore. So that is why if you do not have that trembling infrastructure in Afghanistan, then how you can respond to the uh, poverty, how you can respond to the uh, needs of the people, how you can secure the people, because the security again needs a bureaucracy to, 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 to handle. That is why the, the, the biggest and the deepest catastrophe uh, we are witnessing gradually is the collapse of the, in, the, the government infrastructure, and that will, uh, I think, uh, pose Afghanistan into deepest and saddest story in the near future. Thank you for that very thoughtful um, comment. Uh, Rangina, maybe we can go to you now. What, what is the biggest takeaway for the last year for you? Uh, <clears throat> thank you. And uh, I do agree uh, with uh, Minister Balki and his assessment of the collapse of systems. However, I do look at it at the past 20 years as an Afghan who returned back to serve Afghanistan in various different capacities. Um, I started working initially with empowering women financially to then moving on and starting a, a, the first international officially registered school in Kabul uh, for families like myself or others who wanted quality education that we did not see being offered um, at the degree, um, you know, through private school, uh, private schools as well as public schools, and then being appointed to the Ministry of Education at a time that was very, very uh, critically important, not only in the sense of, de you know, deteriorating viol or the violence increasing daily, but also um, at a time where I was challenged to depoliticize an institution such as the Ministry of Education, because for 20 years, the ministry had predominantly engaged in political decisions rather than technical decisions for the enhancement and better betterment of the society in the service of education. And, you know, I tried my best to do what was needed, but then again, an, an institution that had built up for 20 years with various factions and various loyalties and various visions, it was very, very difficult to create a vision that would be a vision that would best serve the children of Afghanistan and not particular interest groups or stakeholders in Afghanistan. So, so all of this to say that Afghanistan, unfortunately, even in the past 20 years, was politically divided with various interests, with various factions, you know, even in the service industry or the service organization, such as the Ministry of Education, uh, we were not aligned to serve one vision collectively. And I think that is the story of the government uh, of the Republic of Afghanistan for the past 20 years, where the various warlords, drug lords, various political factions and stakeholders, women's groups, you know, all of those combined, we really did not know as a nation where we were headed. And unfortunately, the collapse last year is a, is, is a result of that lack of unity. And even in the months and weeks where we were headed towards the collapse, um, you know, I was I was a cabinet member and I was in meetings um, and high officials across the government structure, uh, politicians who were both involved within, the, you know, the cabinet and, and the official roles, but those who were also playing the unofficial roles. Uh, we, we, we did not have our vision together as to what we wanted to do. And unfortunately, you know, any organization without a clear vision collapses. It is extremely unfortunate to witness what we have, but I do hear um, from colleagues and friends and people as devastated as they are 
um, and and not not nothing of what we have heard so far or what we've been hearing for one year. Um, I'm not denying anything. Um, there is at the same time a sense of calm, particularly outside of the cities where bombardment, where killing and destruction and bombs was taking place and. And I think we as responsible leaders need to recognize that you know we we all had a hand in how Afghanistan was treated and and a good um, number of the society that was not happy with the services and with the leadership that was provided to the country for 20 years they finally not uh, philosophically, but they aligned themselves with the Taliban forces because they saw that as a way out of the destruction that they were facing every day. Um, and so it's unfortunate um, that Afghanistan has fallen in the way that it has. Uh, but as in retrospect, I'm not surprised uh, by the fall at all. Hmm. Well, thank you for that very sobering assessment as well. Uh, Tony, did you want to briefly offer uh, your one big takeaway? I guess from a U.S. perspective, yes. my one takeaway would be that we do have enduring responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan. Many Americans often want to, want to turn away and forget, but we've invested in generations of Afghans who actually believed in our values and believed in what we said we were there helping them to do. Uh, we still have close partners who are trying to leave that we left behind. We have others who want to stay and help revive the vision of a, of a more democratic, more modern Afghanistan. So we have this enduring responsibility with much less influence and leverage. What that means, however, is that we have to find a new way to remain engaged, to maintain to the degree we can unity within the international community that cares about Afghans, that cares about Afghan women, that cares about the human rights. We need to uh, work hard with whatever leverage we have to keep that assistance flowing in there to help revive the economy, but also to hold the Taliban accountable when it misbehaves and not think it can have bad behavior and then get rewards. And that includes in the area of terrorism, as we were reminded recently with the al-Zawahiri um, Elimination in Kabul, the Taliban have strong ties with al-Qaeda that they've had for a long time. And the, the UN reports on terrorism have regularly been reporting that they maintained those ties, even though there was some expectation they would not. And so we do have a, an enduring strategic interest also in very much knowing what's happening in Afghanistan. Nobody wants, I think, for, for the United States, a return to Afghanistan as a source of instability or terrorism, either in the region or, or elsewhere. So uh, I think the main message thus is an enduring engagement by the United States is very important for U.S. values and U.S. interests. Mm. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Breshna, go to you. I know you wanted to ask some questions, please. Yes, I have a couple of questions. My first question is uh, to Ms. Minister Balhi. An important uh, condition for the recognition of the uh, Taliban by the international community is to respect the rights of uh, uh, women and girls, which the Taliban have failed to do so far. So why do you think the Taliban, who are so eager to be recognized uh, by the international community, continue to stop girls from going to school and uh, above grade six? Uh, well, first of all, I'm a little bit confused whether recognition is a big agenda for Taliban or not. Mm -hmm. Because I do not see Taliban as an ideological organizational group who are looking for power or who are looking for a long-term agenda for Afghanistan or the people of Afghanistan. Because majority of the Taliban whom I know when I, we were discussing uh, that two weeks I was in Kabul, uh, they were just looking some tactical issues in Afghanistan. That is why it is now one year you do not have a single paper talks about the political structure for Afghanistan. There is a book written by Haqqani that is not from the Taliban, and he himself says that 
this book is not representing the Taliban. This is my own ideas. I have put it together in a book and I published, which is the Islamic State or the Islamic Emirates. But no Taliban recognized that book even. That is why uh, I see Taliban with multi dimensions, multi layers, multi faceted, and multi agendas. Every Talib is just following its own uh, agenda and its own hatred that he had because of certain circumstances. That is why uh, the, 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 the leadership, they belong to a minority backward low value culture in Afghanistan. That is why they uh, amalgamated their low value culture with the ideology, political ideology. So these two combined approach has resulted into anti-girls education in Afghanistan or the women's rights in Afghanistan. Otherwise, the areas where the Taliban leadership came from, I was working two years in, the, in these areas and I have seen the villagers, the tribal people, they were very much fond of education for girls. They had they had even uh, they announced kind of fines for those families who were not sending their girls to the school. That was not from the central Kabul government. That was the decision of the uh, the tribal uh, elder people. Mm -hmm. So that is why uh, I don't think they are they are very much uh, into these politics of recognition in all these business, and they 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 just do whatever their agenda uh, is. I'll not go uh, deep into that uh, that analysis. But one more thing is also important that uh, uh, Ambassador also was talking about, and that is uh, that the relations between the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda and other international terrorist groups, because uh, I see a symbiotic relations, a correlation be <coughs> between these two groups. So you cannot differentiate Taliban from the international terrorist networks and uh, on the other side also. So that is why what they are doing nowadays is all about the combination of the tribal low value culture and also the political ideology and the religious ideology that these two came together and defining the uh, approaches and policies of the so-called Emirates. Thank you, Minister. Uh, my next question is for uh, Rangina Hamidi. The Taliban have repeatedly said they have no problem with uh, girls' education, but Afghanistan's cultural restrictions and social sensitivities have caused the reopening of girls' school to be delayed. Is there any truth in this uh, claim? Thank you for that uh, important question. Uh, I've been asked that question many times. Um, I want to, and I agree with uh, uh, Minister Balchi about the people, uh, the village elders, the tribal elders, uh, you know, one, one uh, being in support of education. And one of the benefits of the past 20 years experience, uh, you know, was that people opened up to the realities and the benefits of what an educated society at large can can be beneficial and so they saw that benefit and they were in support of that and we've seen that level of support continue in spite of the taliban stopping or banning girls from you know continuing education beyond sixth grade um, i think historically for the first time in the history of afghanistan you have more and more people particularly men particularly uh, uh, village elders and tribal elders speaking out against it uh, so that is a good sign. However, unfortunately, a lot of girls, you know, millions of girls remain at home with no uh, future to look forward to. But I also want to um, respond to your question by saying that uh, there are some regions in Afghanistan, about six or seven provinces, we don't know exactly which one, which ones, uh, where girls' education didn't stop um, uh, after the fall. So after August last year, um, uh, Mazar Sharif, uh, which is uh, Minister Balhi's home uh, province, uh, they've continued providing education to girls uh, beyond sixth grade, and they've been able to. So there is almost a kind of a, a, a different approach um, 
to how the Taliban leadership is dealing the situation or dealing with the situation at the grassroots level. And then one correlation that I want to point out is that in the regions, for example, Kandahar, Helmand, Zabul, Uruzgan, um, Paktia, Paktika, the regions that were the least served in the past 20 years, particularly in opportunities for girls' education beyond sixth grade, um, let's be honest and accept the reality that only a handful of city centers in those provinces had the privilege of having girls' schools um, up to high school. Um, so the continuation of the legacy of the past 20 years has now continued with the Taliban. And of course they have the excuse and they will use the excuse that culturally people don't want to send their daughters. And I do want to reiterate that. Um, you know, the narrative right now is as if the entire country, every single family was sending their daughters to school in the past 20 years. And I want to say as someone who witnessed very firsthand that that was not the case. Not every family in Afghanistan, across Afghanistan, sent their daughter to school beyond a certain age. But that does not mean that there were not families who didn't take advantage of the opportunity and allowed girls to complete their school, which is which is the the the, the hope and the wish and the desire that that many people were were hoping to follow. Um, so it is an unfortunate situation, but I think we need to be fair and. Um, and assess the situation that areas that continue to see a lack of progress beyond sixth grade were areas that in the past 20 years didn't really get that much attention from the Republic either. Thank you, Minister uh, Hamidi. Um, Ambassador Wayne, um, the Taliban has freed thousands of uh, prisoners, including terrorists and senior Al Qaeda operatives. Uh, putting the lives of female judges, Afghan national security forces, and women at grave risk. How can the Taliban be held to account, and what is the future of uh, women's rights in Afghanistan? That's a very hard question. Um, right now, the United States, the United Nations, other countries with an interest in Afghanistan do not have much leverage over this government. Um, as several of us have now noted, the, the main interest right now is consolidating power, is consolidating and defining eventually what this Islamic emirate is going to look like. And what this means is that often very conservative members of the Taliban leadership have sway. Uh, as many of us have heard, we weren't there, of course, we don't know, that it was a small group of conservative religious leaders that blocked the efforts of others to leave to have the schools open again in many provinces for for girls so you know this is if we step back and look worldwide after many revolutions there's a period of time where there's an effort by some to consolidate some who are more radical in their beliefs to impose those beliefs and it it takes time to adjust and i think this taliban regime is going through that right now. There's, there's certainly not any big drive to liberalize, and there is not a lot of leverage by the United States and others on them. That doesn't mean that the people in the world that are interested, the United Nations and others, should not be speaking out. I think it is helpful when the United, the United States, when others in Europe, when various UN organizations talk about the importance of human rights, the importance of rights for women and girls, mm -hmm. uh, but not only women and girls, other Afghans, as you, you mentioned, who have a different vision for Afghanistan. Um, that needs to continue and, and deepen, uh, but there needs to be a search for that, that leverage. Um, even though the Taliban has not prioritized, as the visitor said, getting rec international recognition, since no other government in the world, no country has recognized the Taliban, um, there still are some who see value in that. Mm -hmm. They do see value in trading. They see value in trying to build up the wealth and uh, possibilities for Afghanistan. And so eventually this will have more importance. Thus, part of what we have to do now is maintain that as much cohesiveness as possible from the international community to really demand that the Taliban deliver some changes in these 
uh, very bad policies if they want to engage productively with the rest of the world. And in that sense, of course, the neighboring countries are very, very important. So far, they've, they've held with the rest of the international community. Um, but that is going to take continued engagement by that broader community with those neighboring countries, I think, to move in, in that, uh, to, to stay in that constructive uh, um, orientation. But it's going to be hard. There are going to be fits and starts. People will try to engage in some ways. I hope the United Nations will appoint a very a higher profile leader for their mission there who can help be the spokesperson for a number of these changes and try to engage the Taliban. But I think we have to be patient and realize it's going to take a sustained effort. Thank you so much. Michael, back to you. Thanks, Prashna. Uh, so I'd like to take a round of questions from the audience. The hour, not uh, surprisingly, is flying by. Um, but um, I, I know, correct me if I believe that Zara herself has a question that she wanted to pose. Um, and so maybe we could, I think it would be fitting for us to take um, Zara's question, which you could pose. We could put that on the table. And then I could mm -hmm. take some questions from the audience and then Sh online. So why don't you pose that question? Sure. Uh, she said, she asked, no doubt the Taliban have put restrictions on education, especially on women's education. But what makes you, Minister uh, Balkhi and uh, Minister Hamidi, proud as Minister of Education, leaving behind a substandard and corrupt education system with thousands of ghost schools and teachers? So first. And actually, sorry, why don't we take a few more and then we could answer them at th that way we could be we could maximize time um so uh if we've got a few questions here if you could wait until one of our colleagues has a microphone in front of you uh, to pose the question that would be great so we'll start here uh, with scott the gentleman right in the middle with the blue shirt yep um thanks very much scott worden from the u.s institute of peace um great event uh depressing one and i guess my question Building on what Tony said, there's not much leverage in the international community. Uh, we've heard a very sobering report from, uh, from Afghanistan, but I do want to ask the, the Afghan, both of you ministers, you know, where do you see sources of pressure or leverage within Afghan society? We know that, th mm. that urban educated people want uh, education, but you mentioned, for example, tribal elders in, I don't know, Urzgan, Kandahar, were themselves pressuring during the old regime. Are there sources of leverage that the Taliban will listen to more than the international community or more than city dwellers uh, that you can see a, as maybe a groundswell of support for some of these values? Thanks. And Scott, if you could hand the microphone right behind you to Nazila. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. My question goes to former Minister Balkhi and Rangina uh, Hamidi. Um, I want to know what do you think about the uh, school curriculum? which is going to be changed to a fundamentalism one. And I should, uh, I should uh, mention that, unfortunately, the foundation for fundamentalism and extremism was set before the Taliban take over by introducing the kind of dress code that, was, that wouldn't uh, fit well within Afghan culture and banning uh, girls from singing at uh, a school event. So we kind of paved the way, unfortunately, for uh, such a situation. So, but I want to know, what do you think and what are some possible ways to prevent a changing the school curriculum to an extremism one? Because we all know, I mean, it's not to, uh, in, in, uh, in interest of anyone, not for Afghan, uh, neither for international <coughs> community, for the region, for nobody. And you have a lot of support. And I want to know, what do you say to your to the people, to the world leader, to the uh, scholar who are you, who, whom you meet regularly, what's your concern? What's, what the actions that should be taken to prevent such kind of a situation to occur? Hmm. Thank you. I think that should give us some food for thought. Mm -hmm. Who would like to uh, respond first? Please, yes, the first question. Yeah, you. thank you very much for the questions. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, answer to uh, Zahra. Uh, when I went to the Minister of Education, uh, that was, a, I, I can say, the biggest uh, concern to myself because from the 
academics to the bureaucracy with with a ministry which consists almost uh, uh, 70% of the civil service in Afghanistan with all the challenges ahead that was a very difficult task for me and uh, even before accepting that uh, responsibility I was confused and I was always thinking whether to go or not but then I was thinking as a young generation if we are always claiming to serve for Afghanistan why when this responsibility came to me why I should uh, gave away and not try because uh, then maybe people also could blame that why you people are not coming forward. Uh, I came to the Ministry of Education with all the challenges, with, 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 with the corruption, with the political divisions, with very uh, outdated uh, structure. And I was always saying we have a Ministry of Education which does not educate educate our children. So that was the Ministry of Education. There were some ob obstacles, for example, the Taliban uh, prevailing uh, insecurities. When I was there, 1,400 schools were closed. And in 70 districts of Afghanistan, there were insecurities with red alert. Uh, no institutional memory, no past records, all these certain obstacles we had. That is why we were thinking to, to put a milestone and do a gradual development and a progress of education in the country. That's why I announced the decade of education strategy uh, to, for, for the quality education to reform the uh, 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 structure of the education system and also the uh, curriculum and all other uh, uh, seven elements of education I remember. So uh, in, th in, 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 in that situation with this insecurity and also with outdated uh, structure, uh, it, would, it, it was not easy to, to bring reform uh, in, in the ministry in two years, three years, I was always saying that the outcome of the Ministry of Education is a matter of time, <coughs> maybe 12 years or 15 years, that you have to see the quality children who are coming out of the education. Then you could see that, okay, that's the uh, efforts you have done for the education. So that is a, a mission which was undone, incomplete, and uh, uh, I have given detailed reports to the nation at that time how we were fighting against corruption, how we were fighting for apoliticizing the ministry, how we were fighting for quality education. Uh, for, for, for the second question, the leveraging factor in Afghanistan, uh, I think you have all the options on the table, different options you have, because when I talk about leveraging factors, it is not always to find a source from Taliban itself or from a corner of the country. There is a pre prevailing resistance against Taliban. The civil society, they are resisting. The Zahra is resisting in Afghanistan. There is military resistance. There is young generation resistance. There is people, communal resistance against Taliban in Afghanistan. Even I, I would say that some of the Taliban sympathizers who were expecting from Taliban a better situation, a better life based on traditionalism and uh, traditional culture, even they are now not happy with the Taliban. They know that there is no any agenda of serving to the people except some of the uh, sectarian agendas that they have. So all these uh, leveraging factors work on Taliban. For example, a travel ban on Taliban is very effective. We have witnessed that the Taliban, uh, once they were fugitive, uh, came to the Oslo. They gave, they deliver a speech, and they were very much freely. And they, they are nowadays very much confident. Not only confident, but overconfident. So that is why. Uh, that the gradual policies what we have seen in the past one year is encouraging the Taliban that if they fought in the front militarily against 
Afghanistan against Afghanistan's international allies, they can fight more and more in the future to gain any objectives that they are looking for. And for the uh, uh, Nazira's question, uh, the curriculum, uh, that's also again a concern. Uh, we met Scott in, in, in Doha, I was in Doha, and we were discussing about the curriculum. Uh, I, I even delivered my speech, my, my message to Taliban that the Karen curriculum is also made by the ulema, not by some secular groups that, that they are claiming, because uh, in 2014, 2015, this curriculum was uh, written uh, with the group of ulema and very few people from natural sciences. That was not the, curricu the curriculum, even I was not accepting that. I was working and then Minister Hamidi was work working on the reforms of the curriculum for a quality education to the needs of Afghanistan society market. Uh, but uh, there are news from Afghanistan that the Taliban, when they met with the curriculum department, they delivered this message that in the first period we will uh, remove all the democratic, secular, westernized values from the books, and then we will bring some reforms. Even if they do not bring reform, unfortunately, every day, the professional teachers are leaving their school infrastructure and school environment to other uh, jobs. What will be replaced instead of these teachers are the madrasa uh, graduated people. We had also in Afghanistan that in the Republic time that 12,000 of the teachers were from the madrasa background, but they were teaching the, uh, the then curriculum. Now there is an, uh, a verbal, oral agenda, oral curriculum, which has been taught in, in, uh, in the schools. So the ulema, I mean those Taliban ulema who are now becoming the teachers in the schools, instead of teaching physics, chemistry, history, biology, they teach how to fight against imperialism, how to fight against the, uh, you know, the westernized values or, or certain hidden agendas which were in our time in some of unregistered madrasa. Now it's a frank agenda to teach and to deliver for the young generation at the school level. Hmm. Well, thank you, Mirwais. Uh, unfortunately, we need to wrap up soon, but certainly we'd like to hear from Rangina and Tony uh, if they would like to respond to the questions. Uh, Rangina, why don't you go first? <laughs> I would like to, but how much time do I have? Because I know we've gone over time. <laughs> we have, yeah. Please make it concise, but substantive at the same time. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Um, very important questions, and I hope we have opportunities to discuss this later. But uh, what makes me proud leaving? First of all, I'm not proud leaving my country and the ministry. I only had, at least Minister Balki had two years. I had exactly 14 months in a very, very complicated ministry. And as he said, it takes time to bring reforms and to implement reforms. And we were uh, implementing a very robust reform agenda that was not only trying to address uh, breaking the political uh, affiliations and the, uh, the, the chaotic structure of the ministry, but I also, in that 14 months, recognized and realized that the Ministry of Education had been unjust, to be quite honest and bold, uh, for 20 years of uh, allocating resources, uh, human resource as well as capital resource to certain areas and not allocating enough to other areas. And I was trying to, as a minister, as a responsible entity, trying to address how do we as a nation and as a responsible entity, pay for the injustice of the past 20 years. Um, so uh, th there's nothing to be proud of what we've left behind because I simply did not have enough to work on. But um, in terms of the curriculum, um, as Minister Balki also said, the curriculum reform was one of the main pillars of our reform agenda. Um, we unfortunately did not get to it because the the past 20 years of involvement of the international community with the Ministry of Education kind of created a trash can model of a curriculum where everybody came and dumped whatever they wanted to. And we as an institution accepted every single thing that every other nation brought to us. 
I not only wanted to uh, assess that and see what things were relevant to our society and our culture and our religion and our identity and throw away things that were not relevant. So that, you know, writing or rewriting a curriculum is a process. It does not happen overnight. And from my contacts with uh, my previous staff at the ministry, yes, the Taliban are talking about it. But structurally speaking, they have not done anything to change the curriculum yet. As Minister Bill, he said, it's merely a, a, an oral curriculum change that is being discussed. Um, and so at least on paper and on books, and they don't have the capacity to print the books the, the, the ideologies that they're talking about, it requires resources to print books and to distribute. And we, as both ministers, we know how difficult that was. Uh, and before leaving, I actually signed off on printing the previous curriculum, um, you know, 20, $26 million worth of USAID investment towards printing the old curriculum. And all of that has been printed from what I know, it is now in the country and supposedly they're distributing. Um, finally, that one question, the, um, the last, uh, you know, the, the, and I would just quickly want to address the leverage point. I think the leverage point is also a question around principles and values. Um, the battle of the past 20 years has been around principles and values. And I think there needs to be a deeper conversation about, you know, promoting what is seen as or what is perceived as Western ideology or imperialistic uh, um, ideologies. And unless and until we have a frank conversation about them as a nation and as a people, it is going to be very, very difficult to find that leverage point. Um, and then finally, the question about the girls' um, uniform and, and singing, uh, that is a, a, a a much deeper conversation. And I hope that the woman who asked um, uh, is able to connect with me because uh, that those elements or those uh, conversations was not a, a platform to welcome the Taliban or to Talibanize uh, education system in Afghanistan. What we were discussing, no decisions made, but what we were discussing as leadership was to address the contention in Afghanistan that has always revolved around madrasa versus school. Madrasa is a real, was a reality and is a reality and will always be a reality of the Afghanistan social structure. And until and unless we bring the faction or the divide between the school and the madrasa by having a frank conversation and by addressing the violent nature of how we address each other, we as a nation will never have a unified vision as to how we want to educate our children. For 100 years, we've been fighting this battle, this mental battle of those who've graduated from a madrasa versus those who've graduated from a school. And to be quite honest and frank, neither one is the ideal mo model that we need to stick to, to promote and push down the other. Uh, so I'll end with that, and um, I would like to make myself available for anybody to reach out to me to further discuss the very important points you guys have brought up. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that. Um, so, Tony, uh, the last final quick word is yours. Okay, the quick word. Um, the most inspiring times that I had in Afghanistan were talking to young people talking to those sometimes at the high school level, even the intermediate school level, and then at the university level. Um, because of their eagerness, their joy to learn, their hope to take that learning even further. I remember a, that we had a series of debating law school students who were competing with each other among universities. And this could have been a debate easily in the United States, in Europe, other places, the quality of the thinking of the presentation of the education was just so inspiring. And that's Afghanistan. Those are Afghans. They have this capacity. They have this desire to learn. They have this desire to take their society and their country to a higher level. Those Afghans are still there, even if some of them are now in the United States or Europe or other places. And so we need to build, keep building on that, that long-term investment. And this is acknowledging all the problems with everybody's development policies and the need for a consistent vision in the education ministry, but still 
these brilliant students work their way through that to show their brilliance. So that's the hope for the future. Well, thank you, Tony. Um, I apologize. We have other questions we don't have time to get to. Um, but this has been a wonderful discussion, a difficult discussion, but an important one. Uh, there were two themes that I think stood out in this discussion. One was just the sheer scale of the challenges that Afghanistan faces, the economic crisis, girls' education, capacity constraints, and so on. The second major theme I heard was the limited leverage and influence of the international community on which Afghanistan has for so long been dependent has. There's very little of that. And that puts us in a tough spot. Um, but I think that if we want to be talking about how to move forward and solutions, we need to keep having discussions like this one. So I really want to thank our panelists, as well as Breshna, for, for joining us. I want to thank the Voice of America, which has been a wonderful partner um, to work with. And I look forward to, hopefully, additional partnerships. And of course, wanted to thank um, Zara for, for telling her story, uh, such a brave thing to do for obvious reasons. And of course, there are many others like her that are not in a position to tell their story. So I think we would honor them as well. Uh, with this discussion. So with that, um, I'd like to adjourn. Thank you again, and thank you for our, for our audience. Thank you for all of the, for those of you that, that took out time out of your, your day to listen. Um, so again, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.